Welcome to Hey Therapist. I'm your host, Leslie Ross. With me is my producer, Jay Wesley Lindley. Let's get mental. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Hey Therapist. This is episode 21 and possibly 22. We'll Uh-oh. see. We may be split into two different um Two different episodes, depending on how long we get to talking. Yeah, not sure I'm that interesting, but let's try. (laughs) I think you are. Of course you are. I don't know. So this month is Substance Abuse Prevention Month. It is. And so what we're going to do on Hey Therapist is talk to some individuals who have struggled and overcome. Everyone, just about everyone out there has probably struggled with addiction at some point and substances and I know that I have and and I know April has and she's going to tell her story and then we're going to have, um, Jen's going to come on and talk about sobriety and being sober. Uh, she's going on well over a year now. Awesome. So we're going to have her story and then see what the rest of the month brings. This episode, we are going to be talking to April and she is going to tell us her story. Mm. And I know April through work. Yes. She was at the place that I recently, or the most recent place I've started working has been. That's what year, it's so. going on like three years. And two. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's like 10. And we <laughs> automatically became friends. Yes. It was amazing. It was. Yes. It's always nerve wracking to know. And we had to work very closely in that office together. Yes. And so it was very nice to to get along. Yes, it was. And we have formed this friendship. And over the time, I have learned parts of her story. <clears throat> and I have to say, I don't say it enough to her. I'm going to try to make her cry. I'm going to make her cry on this I, I'm sure I probably will. <laughs> that I find this woman amazing. Oh, and what you. she has done and gone through is is pretty amazing. And that's why I have invited her to come talk about her story. Yes. And tell me her story yeah. on the podcast. Well, look, you already had tears <laughs> coming. So are you happy? I appreciate that. Sometimes I don't feel um, so, you know, all the things. But of all the people in my life, you actually do tell me the most. So I do appreciate that. Well, I try because it's true. It's, uh, I, but no, really, it's not. I it, mean, I'm no different than anybody else. There's lots of people who struggle. Sure. Um, there's a lot of things that come about, uh, and I'm just one person that did something different. That's all. Your story mm-hmm. can help others. I agree. I hope it does. Um, and when, when I first started getting into recovery and knowing how much that I had really been through, I mean, I think that when you are going through it in the moment, you don't realize how hard it really is until you look back. Mm-hmm. And when you look back and you say, holy shit, like I actually just made it out of the fire and I'm kicking out flames at my feet, but it could be a lot worse. Like I could be dead. I could be all the things. And so I always said that one day I hope that I can just gives one person just help one person along the way all of the things that I went through at that point would be worth it Mm -hmm. and so I hope that people listen I know that I'm now kind of in a platform where they have no choice (laughs) (laughs) Um, but you know working substance abuse and mental health um, I hope that there has been somewhere along the way that is you know I'd like to think there is I hope anyways I know that I've I've seen the difference you've made with the clients we had shared clients right and now you're helping a program yes that is centered around uh, people getting back on their feet yes and doing what they need to do yeah. regardless if they want to or not right <laughs> to be productive members of society and to help them understand that it doesn't have to be that way. Right. And that is the end result. And letting, even if it's, you know, I hate to say it like this, but just taking a break for those months and getting into a new groove. I'm hope, you know, we, it's at the end of the day, the hope that that's enough, but yes, helping them when they come kicking and screaming to look at life and say, okay, obviously it wasn't working. Let's try something different. Right. So, So when did your story begin? When do you think you started this your spiral? Um, my spiral actually began. Um, I was 24 years old the first time I tried drugs for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it began a long time before that. Um, my mom, you know, growing up, she was an addict. Uh, my dad, he did everything he could 
he was doing the best he could at the time too he wasn't necessarily an addict but wasn't there either sure um and so then i ended up marrying into uh, i mean he was the worst he was a bad addict um not only that but he was abusive all of the things so i think that i remember the night it happened i remember it like it was yesterday i had already had my kids i was doing all the things um and uh I had no help whatsoever. I was the mom of three. My mom was in and out of jail. I was raising my little brother. He is um, 15 years younger than I am. And so, like, literally, I had four kids in the house, and I had when having no help. And I feel like I had a mental breakdown. I remember sitting mm-hmm. behind the door of my youngest son's in his bedroom. I shut the door, and I cried all night long. Oops. Um, just begging for something different and I woke I finally fell asleep the sun was coming up and I fell asleep for a couple hours and I woke up and I was like you know what if you can't be no join them and that's exactly what I did I regret that decision every day of my life we we were talking earlier about the need I didn't I think I could do anything on my own I was so beat down and broken at that point um life had been I mean just hell I was doing it all by myself Mm -hmm. Um, and so at that point, I, I said, you know what, fuck it. And within, yeah, nine months, uh, it, it well, maybe 10, I lost everything, completely everything. So, and what did that all include? Um, I lost my kids, I lost, um, myself, uh, every sense of everything. I lost every vehicle we owned, we lost our house. Um, everything. I mean, I literally went from, I did not have it good. Um, I had a horrible, horrible relationship with my ex-husband was, oh man, it was, it was horrible. So, but from the outside looking in, it was good. Sure. I mean, we had a house, we had vehicles, we had all the things. Um, I, there was nothing, nothing left, absolutely nothing left. So what do you think led you to the relationship with your ex because at the time you weren't really using right I mean, you were kind of in the life because of mom and you understood it right so what do you think led you to that person um honestly it was like one of those uh, everybody wants to be loved <clears throat> has that thing that they feel like they need to be loved and he showed me the attention um he was a really bad alcoholic when I first met him and I was a teenager I mean I was 19 18 yeah I think 18 um and so drinking was fun sure. you know it was yeah. fun to go out and drink and then it wasn't until and then I ended up getting pregnant um and I it wasn't until Actually, yeah, it was probably right after I got pregnant that I realized that he had a major, major, major drinking problem. That was something that, um, yeah, like it it was bad, Mm -hmm. bad, bad. And he was mean. He didn't, you know, nobody's mean at first when you first meet someone. Right. It's not how it starts. Yeah, nobody's mean. (laughs) Everybody's so great. Um, But then it just slowly got very bad. Um, I think the first time, I'm trying to think back it's been a long time thinking about this um the first time that I knew that it was like my mom was in jail I was pregnant with my oldest and we were staying in this camp trailer that was not even a camp trailer it was you know like one of those camper shells Mm. that go into the back of the truck and it's dead summer I mean it's hot as hell no food no money and he would leave me there for days at a time like I couldn't even I didn't even have a phone to use right and I think at that point once I would try to go somewhere try to do something you know there's times I'd have my sister come and get me and uh, I he would track me down and it was never an okay thing after that so yeah it was it was that I need you don't you know Mm -hmm. I, I can't do this but I also didn't have any avenues to turn on. Sure. It's, I had this surrounded by this great big family, but there was nobody there type thing. Mm-hmm. And maybe I didn't look hard enough. You know, maybe it was that. But at the time, I mean, it was just I didn't feel like there was anything. Right. Well, and because a lot of times when we're in those situations, mm-hmm. there's the guilt and shame that comes. Right. From this is my life. Right. I don't. I don't want people to know this is my life. Right. I don't. If I ask for help they're going to see that this is where I am. Mm -hmm. But in fact, most likely those people would be like, holy shit, 
Right. Let's get you out of here and not, holy shit, how are you living like this? You need to just stay there and deal with your consequences, <laughs> right? True. I mean, so, but True. it's it when we get into that mindset, right. when we're in that abusive mindset, the beat down, the isolation that comes mm-hmm. from having someone who is abusive. Right. And the drugs and the alcohol and not knowing and on edge and, and you you go into survival mode. Exactly. Yes, you do. A, a major survival mode. And then um, to top it off, you know, he had a, a prominent family and it was a come to, I mean, years down the road, figuring out that it was a generational thing. And, you know, grandpa did the same thing to grandma and, and dad did the same thing to his mom and, and all the things. Um, You're at the point where you lost your kids, all of mm-hmm. the things. Yes. Then what? Woo. Um, I lost myself. Um, mm-hmm. If I wasn't lost enough, I, I lost myself. I literally had nothing left to live for. I didn't give a fuck. Mm-hmm. I honestly did sure. not. I was a shitty, horrible human being. Um, I didn't care if I hurt anybody. I didn't care if I got hurt. I literally had nothing to live for. But the crazy part about the whole thing is I stayed with him. I stayed with him in the beatings got worse. The, I mean, everything, everything escalated mm-hmm. because now the need turned into a, I'm holding on to the last thing that I have. So, you know, I went through from the time we lost the kids um, until the time I finally left him was probably I'm trying to think the years fly by so fast. I try to think they back all. now and I'm like, oh my gosh. It was a couple years before uh-huh. it finally, I walked away from him. Um, but everything just escalated and got worse. But in that period of time, I was trying to clean up. I was trying to do things, trying to get the, the kids back and get back on track and then just beating after beating after beating until, I mean, there was just nothing left of me. Sure. So. You were kind of in this spiral. Yes. And that's what happens to a lot, especially women. Right. Who become dependent in these situations. And, you know, not that there are not men who are abused, not that there's not men that who struggle with this. Right. But, you know, women do become more dependent in some of these situations because of the control yes that the man can physically take right yes um downhill spiral like i said i was you know trying to get clean trying to do things the, everything got worse our relationship was horrible mm-hmm. um and so it was i mean i ended up going out to dinner one night with my mom um and we were house sitting for a friend uh and when i got back um he was i come back and my ex-husband was drunk drunk um and we were sitting out back, you know, smoking our cigarettes, doing our thing, just chilling at this house. And I dropped the pack of cigarettes in a water puddle. And when I did that, um, it was the night of July 31st, um, and he went ballistic crazy on me. Beat me for hours until the sun was coming up. Stripped me naked, you know, all the things. Um, and anyways, um, going through that, finally, you know, he was arrested. It took that to get him out of my life Mm -hmm. um I remember you know I was in ICU for you know what four or five days they kept me in a a a coma thing and I'm waking up and at that point as crazy as it sounds it felt like I had absolutely nothing left sure um I was literally beat this time um and I mean by the grace of God I'm even still alive from that Mm -hmm. I don't know what made him finally you know, stop enough for me to get out of that house, all the things. But anyways, so after that, I tried to stay clean. I tried to, you know, I was going to do it. I was going to do it on my own. I was going to do the things. No, 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 no. Um, I ended up, you know, I was holding down a job, but I was getting higher and higher and higher every day sure. um, until finally, like, I was stealing from the company I was working for, started going to jail, in and out of jail. Um, I can't even... There's so many times I've been arrested. Oh my God. <laughs> like, I hear people like, oh, I had to spend the night in jail. That's cute, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's cute. Um, and it still wasn't even enough. Um, you know, I remember my dad picking me up from jail one time. Um, I was in jail numerous times with my mom. Mm-hmm. Like, and so it was just a thing that, you know, happened. But I remember my dad picking me up one time from jail and he just, just, I walked out of jail and I'd been in there for like, 
seven months or something stupid like that and I walked out and he just had these tears in his eyes and he was just crying and he was like when is enough gonna be enough for you and I was like I'm not why do you care I'm not hurting you you know what are what am I hurting right I'm not doing anything to you what exactly is it that I should live for you know and he just he gave me a ride to where it dropped me off at some trap house I mean I just sure with my friends and he just stood there I I said I, you know thanks for the ride whatever and he's like here he said can I buy you some food he said I'm not going to give you any money but you know yeah I was that person um well, sure. and, you know I'm not going to give you any money but can I at least buy you something to eat and I was like I just got a jail dad I'm fine I just ate and he said will you let me come back um and buy you dinner tomorrow and I was like nah nah no, I'm good. I don't need anything from you. I don't need anything from anybody. I'm fine. I don't, you know, I don't need your charity. I don't need your pity. And my dad said, I just want to see you. Mm-hmm. And why do you want to see me? You know, I've heard all the things y'all are saying about me. Why would you want to see me? And um, he just stood by the car. He let me walk in and I looked out the window and he's just sitting there. I think he probably sat out there in the driveway of that house for probably about I don't know. It was probably a half hour, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. I never went back out to talk to him. I never, all the things. Um, And I didn't see my dad again after that until, oh my gosh, I rolled my car one night and I went to jail and I went to jail for about a year and a half um, from that. And my dad picked me up and he put me on a plane to move out here. So that was the jail stint. Dad tried. And you, of course, resisted because that's what we do. Yeah, right. Right? Because right. we're at the depths and no one cares. And right. No one's yes. cared. Where have you been all this time? And yeah. you let this happen to me. Right. Calling, begging for money in the middle of the night. What do you... I want to be dumb. It's three o'clock in the morning. Oh, shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You don't care about me. You don't love me. So, all the things that go along with it. Okay. So, we move. Yes. And we're out here. We're out here. In rural Oklahoma from Utah. Yep. And then what? I finished, um, I, when I first moved out here, um, I, I'm not going to lie, I kind of like got kicked out of the state of Utah. It was part of my, you know, release from jail, get out of here, don't come back, but you do have stipulations, there are things you need to do um, there. But at this point, you know, looking back, I had had, I had started working on myself, I just didn't know how to finish. Sure. Um, so there were things along the way that I had started, but I, you know, I kept telling Carly and Benny, like, Mm -hmm. thank you so much. You know, they, they brought me out here and they were willing and they kept saying, well, how do we know you're not going to do the same thing? You don't, you You absolutely don't. Um, but I'm not going to sit there and tell you, I'm just going to show you something different. Um, so I move out here. I have absolutely nothing, literally nothing. Um, I, the clothes I had on, they were even the jails. Like I didn't have anything. Um, I move out here. Um, I get a job. I start going to therapy. Um, and I actually finished off therapy with um, somebody out here. She was amazing. She really was. Um, she, you know, she would laugh at me because she was going to get her master's. And she's like, I'm going to do my, you know, my end thing on you. And I was like, oh, okay. And she's like, you could really teach me a lot. Because <laughs> at this point, you know, like, I, you know, we skipped around and stuff. But I had been through so much sure. therapy right so much therapy and she's like but anyway so i've i you know i finished up some therapy i got a job um and i have never really looked back mm-hmm. i haven't you know i i've been clean almost 13 years now yeah, yeah that's outstanding years. it is it's great it is but is it ever hard to stay clean off of meth Mm-hmm. No, absolutely not. Okay. Um, I tell everybody all the time, I could not imagine the feeling of getting high. Mm-hmm. I could not. Um, there is, obviously, it was to cover up something. Huh. I say all the time. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, my God, my life is so <laughs> fucking great. Let's go get high on meth. Like, this right. is so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Granted, you know, you may be introduced to it at a party or something, and that may be how you get hooked. But eventually you are using drugs to cover something up. Mm-hmm. That pain, that trauma, that all the feelings that come along with it, the shame, the guilt, you're using to cover that up. So I do not think about it. I don't think about getting high. I don't think about using. Um, I do sometimes, you know, like the feelings will come back, you know, just because you heal from something doesn't mean it takes it away. Sure. Um, but what it does do is give you an opportunity to look at it in a different light. But there are some times where, you know, memories will come back, all the things will come. And I'm sitting here going, 
oh, you know, like, what would they, you know, like there's that, I don't want to get high and I don't ever want to feel that feeling again, but man, that hurts, you know, sure. that stuff hurts, sure. you know, cause we talked about, you know, my dad standing in the driveway enough and the reality of it was that even losing my kids was not enough, you know, losing my kids was not enough to get clean. So just because I've been through all those years of therapy and mm -hmm. all that stuff, that shit hurts. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a pain that comes. So Meth was your drug of choice. It was. I know that you have a healthy relationship with alcohol. Have you always been able to have that? Or was it a long time before you allowed yourself to try that? Because not a lot of people who get clean can have a healthy relationship with anything. Right. And I know you avoid pain medication because this one over here with her broken back won't take anything is always yes, hurting right but the fear is there it is of the addiction it is I think that you know what they say is true once an addict always an addict mm -hmm. and I will never let myself ever ever forget that have I always had a healthy relationship with alcohol Probably not. It took me a long time. You know, you go through a program and you go through therapy, you go through all the things and it's like, do not do anything. You're an addict. Right. Drinking all the things. And I believe that. Mm -hmm. I believe that, you know, talking about... <laughs> it took me a while. It mm -hmm. took me a, a good, good while to trust myself enough to say, okay, you know, maybe I can drink a little bit. And to be honest with you, I think it's because I hated it so much. Like... I also grew up in a culture, we were Mormon, drinking was not normal. Right. So, like, I don't know, I hope my dad don't see this, but. <laughs> Sorry, dad. Listen, Sorry, dad. Life is prep. But, yeah. I, I yeah. say it all the time. Life is prep. <laughs> all people in the life and all things that happen are free game. Yes. And what happened in the past is the past. And we don't hold right. things against people. We're right. not carrying it. But it's the reality of what your life was. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, drinking as a teenager, all the things. Um, but my dad, when he comes to visit, you know, he sees somebody drinking and they're automatically alcoholics. Sure. And that has been embedded in my head mm -hmm. my whole entire life. Um, I think that as an addict, you have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. You have to know your limits and you have to know, um, you know, recently... I guess within probably the last two or three years, I did have to put it in check. Mm -hmm. You know, there I had to realize that I wasn't the same party. I wasn't going out to the bars to have fun anymore. You know, I wasn't doing the the party stuff, and I needed to slow down, and I needed to, in a sense, turn that page and grow up sure. a little bit. To stop drinking competitively. That's exactly. What I was, that's what my dad, you know you're getting older when you stop drinking competitively. And that is true, too. You do not have to be the last <laughs> one awake. You do not have to drink all the beer. You I don't mean, have to go just, shot for shot. Exactly. <laughs> you don't have to play those drinking games anymore. So um, to answer the question, I didn't trust myself at first. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure I'd ever be able to trust myself again. Um, but yes, it took a while. And now um, I can honestly say that I can take it or leave it. I can, you know, have a drink and not think about it for months at a time. Right. Um, so, yeah, it. I know it can't be like that for everyone. And so I really don't encourage it to people. Um and, you know, I'm sitting here trying to think, and I'm, I'm thinking in the back of my mind. I, I don't know what made me even try it for the first time or to test that limit with myself. I think sure. it may have probably been southeast Oklahoma boredom. Uh, uh, that'll I mean, do it. You know. <laughs> but I was also... Some back roads will get you every time. <laughs> every single time. <laughs> Um, but I also, you know, I had to find myself. You know, right. like going through all of that... I woke up, it, it feels like I just woke up in a new world. I woke up um, in Southeast Oklahoma, mm -hmm. Roof America mm -hmm. of all places, like, and I didn't know myself. I had no idea who right. I was. I, I, you know, all of these changes had come in through my life. I was, you know, I was a caretaker for so long in my family. I mean, growing up, our house was getting raided all mm -hmm. the time. Our, you know, on top of that, my mom was so bipolar and had, you know, schizophrenia symptoms and she untreated, correct. untreated until yep. I was 30. Um, she was undiagnosed until I was 30. So you add meth and alcohol in the situation and she 
was a huge cocaine dealer when we were in elementary school and yeah. was on the news and our house got raided and you know all of the things so like there's all of these things like I don't know that I ever really knew who I was sure um because this was your normal it was that it was, was normal. that chaos that mm -hmm. complete contemption all the time that was always there it was like you know taking care of my sister in the middle of the night because my mom's getting her ass whooped getting you know just all the things that come along with it so I woke up it feels like literally you know I went from that to a mom to a wife to just all these different phases but I had to figure out who I was right I and it was um I don't know it's kind of like a winning feeling uh -huh. it's like guess what you don't know this about me, but I can sit in the room by myself now and I don't need anybody. <laughs> like, it's just like this, um, I tell everybody all the time, like, it just feels like your shoulders can be held high again. And I know that's such a weird analogy, but it's like, it, there's nothing sitting there anymore mm -hmm. and you can actually breathe and you can feel yourself and to know yourself and to know when you're slipping like right when you need to go back to therapy when you need to stop doing this to be able to take that look at yourself mm -hmm. I mean it, it's um it's freeing it's I don't it is no it really is freeing because you know you you've said all of these things that you were mm -hmm. but you were never you right you never even knew who you were exactly because you didn't get to develop in that and we and I've, I've talked about it before on another episode where <laughs> You know, when you grow up in that trauma and the chaos, mm -hmm. you don't really develop into the person that you should be right. or want to be because you have to manage the chaos. You have to be a parent. You have right. to be a caretaker You have, as a child. Yes. So you don't get to know what being a child is. You don't get to figure out what you want and what you need. Right. And I think in that very same episode that you're talking about, I mean, I'm pretty sure when I was listening to it, you had said something about, you know, going to your friend's house and saying, what, this isn't normal? Right. Like, your parents are talking <laughs> and, you know, your mom's not gone all night. Like, and so, you know, growing up, like I said, we grew up Mormon and mm -hmm. we were in Utah. If your parents smoked or drank, like, drank, you were shunned. Mm -hmm. You didn't get to go to the church you know like the church activities and so it was a lot different and so it was like automatically trying to hide that stuff mm -hmm. begging your mom don't smoke in the car on the way to school with me like and you know so there's yeah no realizing when you realize that first time that your life is not normal like when you were talking in that episode it's um it's a little different like I don't know but you're you don't get to develop and you don't get to do the things you take on a different role mm -hmm. so and I think when we you know when you talk about the the religion uh-huh I remember you telling me that when your parents divorced mm -hmm. you guys were shunned essentially and so you and, and your sister and I don't know if your brother was around at that time or not, not but yet. um you lost your friend group oh essentially because yes. you couldn't go and see the people that you had grown up with and gone to church with and done all the things with yes because of the the shunning right and the truth of the matter is is whether they will admit it now or not it's even family that did that mm -hmm. you know my grandma I rest her soul she was a great woman and I'm not you know I know <clears throat> I know now that as I've grown um and learned mm -hmm. and all the things I can honestly look back and say you know she was doing the best she could with what she had just sure. like every one of us um but I remember after my parents divorced the first time because, oh, yeah, they screwed us up twice. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they didn't do it to us once. They did it to us twice. So, you're you know. Go big. Hey, you know, don't. They didn't, hey, you're not fucked up enough yet. Let's let us get married and divorced to each other again. Let's try again. Like, oh, God, that's a whole new episode. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week as we continue with April's story. For Mike producer, Jay Lindley, I'm Leslie Ross. Thank you all for joining us. Please send any questions or comments through the website, heytherapist.com or email help at heytherapist.com. They may be featured on the show anonymously. Hey Therapist is an SEOK radio production and is for your entertainment purposes only. Thank you for joining us. Make good choices. Mm -hmm.